Now. You ever hear of what they call skeptics? And supposedly, I see in society today <clears throat> that there's a so-called skeptics and then there's a so-called believers. <clears throat> so you have like the skeptics who are out to like debunk the believers. That seems to be of the prevailing uh, working myth in our society today. Um, cleanse your brain of that, please. You cannot understand my talk today if that's your, your working uh, myth, whether you're on the skeptic or the believer side. Um, most people, though, if you're in that mode of thinking, would consider me, consider me to be a skeptic. Um, and we are. We're medical scientists. We're, we're not believers. Well, why are we skeptical? Because the history of science is filled with people who believe in things that simply aren't true. You bet. N waves. Anyone know what N waves are? Well, we've all heard of X-rays. When X-rays were discovered, it set off a craze of finding invisible waves. And there's over 30 articles in prestigious physics journals about an entity known as N waves. N waves don't exist. They were sort of a collective hallucination on the part of the physics community in their zeal to discover new invisible waves. It was something that Serious scientists talk themselves into thinking they really existed. Cultural myths. You bet they, uh, uh, my favorite here is, uh, oh, Davis-Barnes effect, uh, that's another um, scientific effect that isn't real. Albumin and virginium, those are elements which were discovered and yet they're not real. And uh, then we have squash Volkswagen stories. I like this because I think it pertains the most to near-death experiences. The squash Volkswagen story is this. Um, the circus comes to town, and the, the elephants are offloaded uh, to walk up to the arena where they're going to be. The baby elephant sees a red Volkswagen and then sits on it and squashes it. Now the owner of the Volkswagen comes out and is late to work and sees her squash Volkswagen, but has to drive to work anyway. She's pulled over by the police, and she's now in the position of having to explain to the police that an elephant sat on her car. That story has been reported in every newspaper in this country, including the New York Times, including the Seattle Times, as fact. When that story ran in the Seattle Times, it was run on page one. That story has never occurred. There is no police documentation. There is no eyewitness account of the so-called squash Volkswagen story. So just because hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and newspaper reporters report something as being real, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, that doesn't make it real. Here's how we studied these experiences. We studied these experiences from a completely agnostic point of view. Fortunately, we don't have any spiritual beliefs, and we didn't have any philosophical beliefs, so our research group in Seattle had an easy time of this. Um, so, the, you know, in our, this so-called skeptic debunker believer paradigm, which our society is unfortunately locked into, the skeptics call these experiences pseudoscience. There is nothing pseudoscientific about the study of these experiences. We took the attitude of, we're going to study people who say they have these experiences and see where that study leads us. Because, think about it. Crucial point for anyone taking notes. One of the real problems in paranormal research is they are not reproducible events. Premonitions of death, after-death visitations, telepathy. Well, telepathy has been documented in the laboratory now, but even in laboratory situations, difficult to reproduce, out-of-body states. The one paranormal experience which is quite reproducible and quite predictable is the near-death experience. And as we're going to see, studying near-death experiences is a gateway to understanding a new way of thinking about reality. The question isn't, are these experiences real? These experiences, as you will see, are going to teach us what is reality. 
And the amazing thing about the near-death experience and its worth of scientific investigation is the very fact that it's quite reproducible. We know that if 100 people have a, a cardiac arrest, a certain percentage of them are predictably going to have uh, a near-death experience. So that is <clears throat> the uh, missing link in all of uh, so-called paranormal research. So by understanding these experiences, it uh, catalyzes a new understanding of the capabilities of the human mind. So we took a completely agnostic stand. Now, one thing you have to understand is that science itself is embedded with a philosophical viewpoint. All of our society is. And that's a, a philosophical, I, I'm not a philosopher, so you know, I didn't know anything about this, but it's called dualism. And most of the people here have that philosophical out view and our uh, outlook. And dualism is this, the body is a machine, and then there's like a ghost that lives in the machine. That's the dualistic point of view. So there's, you know, and so then there's the people who are just the machine believers. They don't believe in the ghost. They just see the body as a machine. And then you have other people who are the, uh, you know, who just, just believe in the ghost part of it. But nevertheless, that is a particular philosophical viewpoint. It's never been proven. And it's based on a, a philosophy that's hundreds of years out of date and more importantly, on a science which is hundreds of years out of date. So we were not dualists, our research team uh, at Seattle. Um, so we don't, we don't believe or disbelieve in what I call the, the ghostly vapor theory of near-death experiences, which is supposedly like when the person dies, then, then their spirit's like this ghostly vapor that sort of floats out of their body. Uh, we had no opinion about uh, that theory. We, be we believe that these experiences can be studied using standard medical research tools, and we did. Okay. Now, I'm going to briefly uh, describe our study at Seattle Children's Hospital. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on our scientific method because the results of our study are so important to under understanding these experiences that you have to um, be assured uh, of our uh, methods. Uh, in, uh, you know, you, you guys have to know how we reached our conclusions. Now, whenever you're studying something as wacky as out-of-body experiences and dying children, it's nice to have the most conventional and mainstream uh, docs on board. I was lucky at Seattle Children's Hospital. I worked with Jerry Milstein, who was head of child neurology. Don Tyler, who was head of our intensive care unit at that time. Tim Clark, a uh, social worker from Harborview. Nancy Evans-Bush, who's head of the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And uh, we were a multi-institutional uh, study. We worked with the University of Connecticut and the University of Montana. And I've been asked to, to put in a plug for the International Association of Near-Death uh, Studies. And they are the uh, premier uh, counseling uh, and research organization uh, in this area. And there's a chapter here in uh, Cincinnati. We were funded by the National Cancer Institute, to my knowledge, uh, our study is the only government studied, uh, funded uh, study uh, of uh, consciousness uh, and uh, the human brain. Okay, so I've told you all the things we didn't do. So now you want to know what did we do? Well, we just had one question. Our question was, when do these experiences occur? Do they occur to people who are dying? Is it really true that dying patients can remember everything that's happening, even though they're comatose, and process those memories? Or are these experiences secondary falsifications after the fact? Now, our bias was that these were secondary falsifications after the fact, as is our, all medical scientists. Because our paradigm of how the human brain works is that dead dying brains, or you know, you know, not dead brains, but dying brains don't process memories. The, you know, the, the, the being profoundly comatose and conscious and aware, uh, you know, we think of consciousness as a, uh, uh, you know, a function of actual, uh, of your brain tissue, of primarily the outer area of your brain, your neocortex. Um, nevertheless, all of science advances this way. So this is what Whitehead has to say about it. When stubborn facts uh, clash uh, between reason, that's how science advances. 
Let's talk about the secondary falsification models. Those are the ones that you hear about uh, in the media today. Even though our research was done 10 years ago and is widely published in the scientific and medical literature, uh, it does take you know, 10, 20, 30 years uh, before these, uh, this information uh, even reaches uh, the rest of medical scientists. Um, I understand why 99% of medical uh, physicians and scientists uh, believe these exper experiences are secondary falsifications. Susan uh, Blackmore, a uh, brilliant parapsychologist uh, from uh, England, complex, complex computer model of how the brain works, how the retina uh, behaves so when the brain dies, breakdown of the visual image, causes concentric circles, causing the tunnel image, et cetera, et cetera. Ron Siegel, nation's experts on hallucinations, can replicate every aspect of the near-death experience in the laboratory. He says that there's nothing mysterious about it. After people res are resuscitated from nearly dying, they just use you know, the building blocks of hallucinations uh, to uh, create a uh, beautiful story. William Calvin, brilliant, brilliant thinker. And uh, he's a, a um, biologist and a consciousness thinker, written brilliant books. Here's what he said. Patients who can fabulate relate the best story they are able to construct from the data available to them and think it true. So we're not saying that people who have near-death experiences make this stuff up or anything like that. But it's just the, you know, this theory is that the mind hates a vacuum. You've nearly died, like this little girl we saw. Alrighty, so she nearly died. Now her family's been praying around her. They had the expectation she went to heaven. So now that, now that she's resuscitated, her mind invents this story. Sure, why not? That, that's, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And the, the out-of-body experience, Sigmund Freud, over 100 years ago, said, we cannot imagine we're going to die. So it's better to just kind of pretend someone else is dying. So you sort of imagine that that thing there is dying. And that explains the out-of-body experience. Here's the brilliant uh, Seattle thinker, Gary Larson. We see at the top of the uh, slide here, surgeons are having a little joke on this patient. They're shining a light in her eyes and uh, uh, turning the lights off. And now, suddenly I saw a bright light at the end of the tunnel. This summarizes the secondary falsification theory. Okay, now, there are some thinkers who believe that these experiences, in fact, occur at the point of death. In the medical literature, over 30 years ago, Birch and De Pasquale wrote a landmark article in which they interviewed 35 survivors of cardiac arrest, and they concluded that interviewing the survivors of cardiac arrest as crude a tool, as crude a tool as it may be, may give us profound insight on the last few minutes of life. So this thought is not new to me. Nevertheless, I, what is new uh, is that I consider these experiences to be normal and natural. Most of the thinkers in this area consider them to be uh, Dan Carr, temporal lobe dysfunction. As your brain dies, uh, less oxygen goes to the temporal lobe than other areas, start having temporal lobe seizures, and you have this experience. Schnaper believes these are hallucinations, uh, you know, like we talked about earlier, a subset of intensive care unit psychosis. Just some people, when they go crazy, they think they see God. That's kind of that line of thinking. And we've just actually just taken the earlier people's thoughts and just uh, put it in, a, I think, sexier terms. We say that perhaps uh, we all have anatomical circuit boards of mysticism that are, that are normal and natural. Okay. Now, I'll go through this quickly, but I want you to understand our research protocol because I see a lot of misunderstandings in the popular press about near-death experiences, which we specifically addressed uh, in our study. What we were looking for at Seattle Children's Hospital were children who were in good health, nearly died for whatever reason, and then were returned to good health. That is really rare. We had to look over 400 charts in over a 15-year period to find our 26 children. We studied half of our children going backwards, which is not as good from a scientific standpoint, called a retrospective study. And we studied half of our children going forwards, uh, which is the gold standard or a prospective study. 